Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Essenam. I'm going to welcome to Business Live. Coming up, 1,000, first 1,000 applicants for government's 1 billion stimulus package begins assessing funds from NBSSI. IMF says declining global growth worse than forecast. How is that going to affect emerging economies like Ghana? We will be seeking some answers from an economist. And the Joy Business One visits one of Ghana's biggest mushroom production facilities, started by the mushroom queen, Fafape Ama. We will share her story later in the bulletin. Stay tuned for the details shortly. Welcome back to the program once again. The National Board for Small Scale Industries has begun disbursement of funds from the 1 billion CD stimulus program to the first 1,000 applicants of the scheme. The program, which is earmarked towards alleviating the negative impact of the coronavirus, has received over 500,000 applications since it was launched last month. The first disbursement, which was done today, is for applicants on the micro small scheme known as the Adum Loans. The initial disbursement comes a few days after the National Board for Small Scale Industries, NBSSI, announced a six-day extension to the application process. Even though the disbursement has commenced, potential businesses affected by the impact of the coronavirus pandemic are still allowed to apply before the end of the extension day. Executive Director of the MBSSI, Kosi Yanki Aye, has been explaining the criteria used in the selection process. Started, we did an allocation based on population across the nation in terms of what percentages are in each region. Then you look at also those who are in productive engagement within those regions, in all the 16 regions. Based on that, we looked at a second one, which is those who are applying, percentages that are applying, right? And based on those percentages, you are located to various beneficiaries. Since we wanted to showcase the process to you and show you the first thousand beneficiaries, we did the allocation of all the 16 regions based on the number and the process we wanted to show to you, which is those who within the first few weeks of the application had done it. And so that is exactly what we showed you. We showed you based on the numbers, those with the right information, those within the first uh, month of um, opening the process had put in, based on the percentage, based on population census, based on productive engagement, and that is what you have. So that's how we selected it. The funds which are being transferred through the Ghana Interbank Payment System is managed by telecom operator Vodafone. Head of Mobile Financial Services at Vodafone, Martin Obeje, has assured safety of the system. The set of activities that we do is, because the system is not designed for people to defraud, what happens is that we pick the mobile number that was used to register. So the mobile number that you put in, as your mobile money receipt number, we pick that number. We take that number into a central repository, which is uh, by Gibbs. And then we put in that number to verify whether your name, Kojo Mensa, plus the mobile number you provided, is the same Kojo Mensa registered to that mobile number that is in the system. The interest on the soft loan facility remains at 3%. Hollard Life Insurance has joined calls by industry players to extend the deadline for meeting the new minimum capital requirement for insurance companies, even though insurers have up to June 2021 to meet the requirement. Director of Hollard Life, Nasiru Idrisu, says the effects of the outbreak should be enough reason for the NIC to reschedule the deadline. The impact of COVID-19 on the economy is unfolding with every passing day and it's quite difficult to really understand the complete effect. The insurance sector is also impacted with premium collections falling, given the prevailing restrictions. It is for this reason that the managing director of Hollard Life, Nasiru Idrisu, is supporting calls for extension of the June 2021 deadline 
for meeting the new minimum capital requirement set by the regulator. I think that Ghana is not in isolation as far as the impact of COVID is concerned. Other countries have started doing this already. Our regulator is very responsive, you know, and already there are a lot of work going on now. And I believe um, pretty soon there will be some announcements to that effect. Yeah. Remember, we are a global giant and we have the capacity, we have the pedigree to meet it. However, as I said, the uh, COVID impact is not just peculiar to Ghana. It's across board. Our regulator is listening, is watching and know what is happening. The thing that is affecting businesses, they will definitely um, be responding to this appropriately. He was speaking at the Hollard Malcolm Partnership launch, which seeks to sell Hollard insurance products using the Malcolm shops across the country as retail centers. Patience Achianu is group CEO of Hollard Ghana. With this partnership, many, many, many households who previously did not have access to insurance products will start easily being able to access insurance. And this will contribute significantly to the very low insurance penetration that we currently have in Ghana. And what this seeks to do is to provide insurance products across selected Malcolm shops in the country via what we call Hollard on the go boots. On his part, group chairman of Malcolm Ghana, Bagwan Kupchandani, says the outbreak has rather had a positive impact on the sale of essential items at his outfit. It's still a busy place. Uh, it's true, uh, the, we are not selling very many expensive item, but in food and beverages, uh, we are doing better than we were doing before. It's true, in some segment, sales have gone down. It's bound to happen. When you are not happy, you don't want to go and buy an expensive piece of electronic or furniture. You don't want to do that. You are not in that kind of a mood. You know? Bismarck Ausa, Joy Business. Senior Minister Yao Safomafo has assured businesses in the tourism industry that government will push for donor agencies to support its agenda of reviving growth in the sector. According to him, the newly launched $9 million tourism development grant scheme is just the beginning of many policies to minimize the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on tourism operators. Thanks. The first ever tourism enterprise support program. This is the first time such a scheme is being implemented in the history of this country to support the tourism industry. The grant scheme, among others, aims at supporting registered individual enterprises and other enterprises operating in the tourism and hospitality sector. I think we got the good news that the initial capital of nine million is just the initial capital and if you apply and the promotion goes on and the change we all expect in the tourist industry takes place definitely will be the beginning and there will be a lot more money put in. Indeed, normally when the World Bank finances a price, it's an initial sum. You expect a donors along the line to buy into it, make it bigger. So I would say that the operators of this should make a success out of it and attract a lot more money into this whole enterprise. Honorable ministers, this support comes at a time that the world is facing an immeasurable global health emergency with a huge, devastating social and economic impact on our societies and our livelihood. Honorable Minister, tourism is uniquely positioned to help the societies and communities to promote and retain growth and stabilize because tourism has that cross-sector approach and this helps to influence things in a very indirect manner. Throughout the years, the tourism industry has continuously demonstrated its resilience as a business to overcome environmental problems because the tourist industry is, is environmentally generated. And therefore, when there's a pro 
problem within the environment, it is the first to act to solve the problem. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has cut its global economic forecast for 2020. The fund says the coronavirus pandemic is causing a much steeper recession and a slower recovery than initially accepted or predicted. As a result, the organization is predicting global GDP will contract by 4.9% from its initial 3% forecast in April this year. So my question then is, how will this affect your ball of kinky or my chilled glass of Sobolo? Economist Professor Godfrey Wappen joins me via Zoom for more on this. Thanks so much, Paul, for your time this evening. First of all, if you can hear me, I mean, this new forecast of GDP growth being downgraded, how is that likely to affect my locally brewed Sobolo or your ball of kinky? <laughs> Well, that's that's interesting. Um, I mean, it's, it's as simple as saying that um, the the sharp contraction also re will reflect in income losses. Okay, so perhaps it's possible that you have your job secured, but of course, so many people are look, going to lose their jobs or they have lost their jobs. If you look at the the lockdown, uh, the the productivity hours lost it's translating to over 3 million full-time job losses. And that is very, very huge. If you look at it also within South Saharan Africa alone, uh, income losses is estimated to be in excess of $200 billion. So that, that, that is huge for all of us. Again, given if you look at the global um, forecast that you have looked at, and mm. the fact that Ghana is not an island, certainly it's going to, have, it's going to drag our growth also uh, uh, back to some extent. We have had our own challenges with, with the lockdown, and even with the, with, with the fact that we have eased the, the, the lockdown, people naturally are doing some kind of um, lockdown in order not to expose themselves here and there. So mm. activities, traffic, movement has not reached pre-pandemic level. And right. therefore, so right. when output decelerates sharply like that, Again, it has implication for consumption volatility and then income volatility. As right. Example. Before we bring it down to Ghana, Prof, we are told that this is the biggest economic fall since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Yeah. Does this new projection by the IMF um, paint a gloomy picture of the global situation? Yes. Yes. I mean, this is like um, a, a pandemic that we haven't seen in the recent time. Uh, in fact, the economic hangover from this pandemic, even at the global level, then you can translate that to regional, national level, is going to, it's going to go beyond a generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the scar from this is going to be with us for, for so many years to come. It's going to change the, the, the structure of our society. It already has exposed the level of inequality, uh, educational inequality, wealth inequality, inequality along all the dimensions that mm -hmm. we have talked about. And, and, and that is okay. very huge. Right. We are running out of time, but Prof, I mean, Ghana as a country has largely depended on international support. It looks like there's nowhere to run to now, nowhere cool. And for instance, China, which is our, one of our main sources of funding, is to log growth of about just 1%. U.S. is projected to shrink by 8%, India by 4.5%. Is this just telling us it is enough signal to us to start looking into the domestic market for revenue generation? We've had this discussion before. How do we go about yes. it? I think that we have to, we have to look within. Uh, our own future uh, uh, depends on us. Of course, the, regardless of the helping hand that we can find, either from US, China, the best helping hand that we can ever find as a country is at the end of our own arm. So we have to look within. And then we have to make sure that we plug all the leakages in our revenue envelope and pursue efficiency in our expenditure patterns. All we right. are not but, alone yeah. in this. Mm. The IMF also said quickly in 30 seconds, the IMF also says that governments across the world have announced nearly $11 trillion in fiscal measures. Have we as yes. a country done well with our fiscal measures? I think that uh, if you look at uh, the, de the deficit at the global level has increased. In fact, a GDP in terms of, uh, if you look at this, the extent to which fiscal deficit will translate to that, we are looking at the global level more than 7%. And all of that. Of, of course, within Ghana, Ghana government has found a very more um, enabling way of doing or financing the deficit by roping in Bank of Ghana. I think that that is that is a good move, and that should be sustained. But more importantly, 
uh, we need to pursue efficiency and value for money the, and, and how uh, going forward. And that way we'll be able to aid the recovery. Then it will also require some kind of realignment in terms of our budget. The global prediction gives Ministry of Finance a better perspective to also come out with their media review, recalibrate the macro numbers, and then we'll, we'll have a fair idea of the extent to which the pandemic has affected us, and then also uh, uh, the recovery strategy. But of course, from the IMF report, it's obvious that uh, we, uh, we are not expecting a quick V-shaped recovery. recovery. Uh, the recovery is going to take a little longer than we, we thought. All right, Prof. And so thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, thank great you. to have a new. Uh, so we move on. And as the COVID-19 case counts continues to increase, metropolitan and municipal authorities are warning they may be compelled to close down market centers in the Ashanti region where traders flout COVID-19 safety protocol. Similar action was taken during the period of the partial lockdown to enforce social distancing to contain the spread of the virus. That Santi Hene himself is embarking on a campaign to encourage adherence. And that sense of Mensa has more in the following report. The Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly is collaborating for two for charity foundation in the program with funding from MasterCard Foundation. It seeks to promote personal hygiene in addition to social distancing to control the spread of COVID-19. Dr. Thomas Ejakupoku is executive director of Otunfo Charity Foundation. This is a serious pandemic. Menshia, uh, from the beginning of this COVID, uh, has been part of it. But we think that at this point, we have examined the main issues and we think that we must step in. And we have identified social distancing at our marketplace as a, a potential threat to the fight of COVID-19. And that is why Utumfo, with all Nananum, are stepping in. And we are specific. We think that with our influence, we can speak to our people. We are not stopping them. We are also providing sanitizers, soap and water, and rainwater bucket to ensure that not only do they distance themselves, they also wash their hands at the protocol demands. KMA chief executive Osses Benchi charged market queens to lead a crusade against the disease by enforcing preventive measures at the market or have them closed beginning of next month. From Monday going, we'll be going out there. This time, not only KMA will be going, but we'll be going out there with the representatives of Otunfo, Ose Tutu II. He is the owner of the land. He gave us the land, and we are working on the land. And he is the owner of the region. So now he himself has waved into the fight. So we are all going there to observe whether the traders are complying. In fact, any market that refuse to comply, we will, we will have no other di direction to go rather than to close it down. So that is why we are preempting them. We are cautioning them that we don't want to close any market, but if they should fail to comply, then we will not do any other thing apart from closing it down. Meanwhile, the KMA has served notice of an impending decongestion exercise to raid the pavement of traders. Leader of KJTI Petty Traders Association, Nana Prempe commits to the course even before the assembly descends on defiant members. And with this advent of the COVID, uh, pedestrians are not to be uh, impeded on their walkways, but you realize that the, all the pedestrian areas have been taken over by the petty traders. So it is an admonishment on we the leadership that henceforth we must advise our people, especially my colleague traders, who are selling on the pedestrian ways, that they should vacate from there because the Assembly has made provision for us in the other satellite markets. And I know that uh, the Assembly is going to embark on a, a program to decongest us from the road. But uh, I will take this opportunity to advise my colleagues on the stretches of the roads in Kumasi that it's high time we leave the roadside and we are going to take it upon ourselves as leadership to also go down to talk to our people. Nana Asensu Mensah reporting. 
And that's our program this evening. We are sorry um, we are unable to bring you the Joy Business Van as usual, but catch us same time next week for another edition of the Joy Business Van. My name is Sandra S. And I'm up and you log on to myjoyonline.com for a slug business for more business news update. But of course, I'm back at 7 p.m. on Joy News Prime with more business news update. Thanks so much for watching and cheers. Thank you.